Janet Christensen grew up in a Mormon family in Virginia. In 1998, she met Raven Abaroa, who was also a Mormon. They met at Southern Virginia University, where she played soccer. He was a fellow soccer player who instantly swept her off her feet. In August of 2000, after two years together, Janet and Raven married at the Mormon Temple in Washington, D.C. They then settled in southeastern Virginia. Her friends and family thought that the life for the newlywed couple was perfect. Soon after their wedding, a job opportunity took the couple to Durham, North Carolina. Both of them took positions at a sporting goods company. Not long after that, Raven told Janet he wanted out of the marriage. He told her that he had been cheating on her with several different people. Before they separated, Janet learned that she was pregnant. Janet did not want to raise the baby as a single mother, so the couple tried to make things work. To friends and family of Janet, it seemed like it was working when they welcomed their son Caden on October 17, 2004. Raven told Janet that he would no longer cheat on her, that she was the only one for him and that he would make it work. Just when it seemed things were getting better, their marriage suffered yet another blow. Raven was caught stealing from the sports apparel company where they both worked in December of 2004. He eventually pleaded guilty to five charges of embezzlement, but avoided serving any jail time. Janet was mortified and resigned from her job. This now meant that on top of all the other problems, they also now had financial problems. On the evening of April 26, 2005, Raven called 911. He told them that Janet was not alive anymore and she had been shot. According to him, he left the house at 8 p.m. to go play soccer with his friends. He said that Janet was getting ready for bed then. He goes on to claim he returned home after 10 p.m. and then found Janet's body in their bedroom. Although Raven said that Janet had been shot, Durham police, who arrived on the scene, quickly realized she had been stabbed. Investigators took crime scene photos and all the evidence they thought might be useful later. As they were working on the case, Raven moved to Salt Lake City, Utah with their son, Caden. There, he met Vanessa Pond. She was a single mother whose daughter was in the same daycare program as Caden. They soon started dating. Raven mentioned to her that his wife passed away, but did not elaborate. After moving in with them, Vanessa decided to go online to find out more about what happened to Janet. After seeing that someone took Janet's life, she questioned Raven. He had an answer for every question she had and she believed he was innocent. In the summer of 2008, three years after Janet's life was taken, Vanessa and Raven got married in the backyard of her parents' home. When Janet's sisters learned of this, they decided to reach out to Vanessa to warn her that they believed Raven was responsible for what happened to Janet. After Vanessa was informed by Janet's sisters of their suspicion, she again questioned Raven. This time, he began acting in ways she did not understand. According to Vanessa, he could say the most horrible things, and then moments later he would apologize. The outburst then became physical. One day he grabbed Vanessa and threw her up against the wall and she fell. Raven tried to convince her that she merely tripped. Just four months into their marriage, Vanessa feared for her safety. The couple separated and the marriage was annulled. She went public in 2009 saying that she also believed Raven took Janet's life back in 2005. Also, in 2009, Durham Police Detective Charles Soule was assigned to Janet's case. He looked at Raven's initial statements and found that they were contradictory. Then, as he was reviewing the crime scene photos, something stuck out to him as odd. He noticed the contact case on the counter with the top off. This indicated that the contacts were probably not in there. This would be contrary to her going to bed or as Raven said, in the bed going to sleep. When police interviewed Janet's family and friends, they said that Janet was consistent with removing her contacts before going to sleep. Charles Soule found this detail to be suspicious. Charles also found it strange that there was no disturbance in their bedroom. A stabbing is usually violent with a struggle. Raven was arrested on February 1, 2010 and was charged with taking Janet's life. Then, in July of 2010, Janet Abaroa's body was exhumed so that the authorities could determine if she had been wearing contacts when she was buried. Dr. Charles Zwirling examined the remains. He was able to remove fragments of contact lenses from Janet's eyes. Dr. Zwirling then conducted lots of tests using sets of pig eyes and contacts to prove that the contacts he found on Janet's eyes were ones she wore before her life was taken.
and were not ones that would have been placed on her eyes for some reason at the funeral home. Raven Abaroa's trial began in 2013. Prosecutors presented him as a controlling husband. Vanessa also testified against him and talked about his aggression on the soccer field and how his aggression turned on her. In May of 2013, the jury failed to reach a verdict. Eleven people said he was guilty, but one person believed Raven to be innocent. The judge declared a mistrial. Then, before Raven's second trial could start in March of 2014, Raven decided to enter a plea deal for voluntary manslaughter. A judge sentenced him to a pitiful 95 months to 123 months in jail. He was granted credit for the four years he had spent behind bars before and during the trial, which was applied as time served. Raven did not testify at his trial, but he spoke in court after being sentenced. I would just like to state that I didn't receive a fair trial the first time. I don't think I'd receive a fair trial a second time. I don't think it's worth risking the possibility of spending the rest of my life in prison for something I didn't do. I take this plea deal to ensure that doesn't happen, and that's the only reason. Raven was released from prison on Christmas Day in 2017. Serving less than three years, he now lives in Utah. Janet's brother Mark Christensen had this to say about his sister. The world should remember Janet as an amazing person. Somebody who was kind, someone who was loving, someone who would just show you how to be a better person, someone who can make you laugh, someone that can make you happy. The bodies of three women were found floating in Tampa Bay, Florida on June 4, 1989. The first body was found when several people on board a sailboat crossing under the Sunshine Skyway saw an object in the water. The second body was seen floating on the pier in St. Petersburg, two miles north of the first. While the Coast Guard were recovering the second body, a call about a third body was received. The body was seen floating 200 yards to the east of the second body. All three females were found floating face down, bound with a rope around the neck. Autopsies show that all three victims had water in their lungs. This proved that they had been thrown into the water while still alive. They were identified as 36-year-old Joan Rogers and her two daughters, 17-year-old Michelle and 14-year-old Christy. It was determined that all three of them were assaulted as well. Investigators decided to create a timeline of events leading up to their bodies being found. On May 26, 1989, Joan, Michelle, and Christy left their family farm in Wilshire, Ohio for a vacation in Florida. It was the first time they had left their home state. They stayed in Orlando, Florida for a few days. They were last seen alive at a hotel in Tampa on June 3, 1989, and the next day they would be found on June 4. Marine researchers at the University of South Florida estimated from currents and patterns that the victims were thrown from a boat and not from a bridge or dry land. Joan's car, a 1984 Oldsmobile Calais with Ohio license plate was found at the boat dock by the Courtney Campbell Causeway. Inside the car, investigators found notes written by a man on a brochure. The man wrote down directions and a description to his boat to Joan. So far, investigators knew roughly when the crime took place and that the person responsible owned a boat. Local police decided to post images of the note on billboards in the Tampa Bay area. They were hoping someone would recognize the man's handwriting. They tried their best to catch the man as they believed he was planning his next attack. Fortunately, their efforts paid off. Someone called police saying their former neighbor's handwriting looked exactly the same as the handwriting on the note. They had a copy of a work order their former neighbor had written. Through handwriting analysis, the two samples were matched conclusively. The man whose handwriting it was is Oba Chandler. A palm print found on the brochure was also matched to Chandler. He had sold his boat and left town with his family soon after the billboards appeared. Chandler was found in Daytona Beach and he was taken into custody. Chandler was born on October 11, 1946 in Cincinnati, Ohio. When he was 10 years old, his father took his own life. At the funeral, Chandler reportedly jumped into his father's open grave. When he was 14 years old, he began stealing cars and was arrested 20 times as a juvenile. As an adult, he was charged with a variety of crimes, including possession of counterfeit money, loitering, burglary, kidnapping, and armed robbery. Later on in life, Chandler found work as an unlicensed aluminum siding contractor. At his trial, Chandler said he met Joan, Michelle, and Christy Rogers and gave them directions, but he never saw them again. 
Chandler admitted that he had been in Tampa Bay that evening. The police had evidence that telephone calls were made from his boat around the same time. Chandler's daughter testified that her father had talked about ending the lives of three women and that he was afraid of returning to Tampa Bay. On November 4, 1994, Chandler was found guilty. It was decided that he has to pay for the crime with his life. Chandler awaited execution of his sentence at the Union Correctional Institution. On November 15, 2011, Chandler was executed at the Florida State Prison in Rayford. Investigators always believed Chandler was responsible for a lot more crimes. You do not just commit such a heinous crime and then be done. On February 25, 2014, investigators revealed that DNA evidence identified Chandler as the man responsible for taking the lives of Ivelisse Berrios Beggaries in Cold Springs, Florida on November 27, 1990. Ivelisse was a 20-year-old newlywed who was last seen at Sawgrass Mills Mall where she worked at a sporting goods store. When she did not return home, her husband went to the mall and found her car, a 1985 Ford Tempo with the tires slashed. It is believed that Chandler, after watching the victim for two days, slashed the tires, arrived in the guise of a helpful stranger, and offered to help. Three hours after she was reported missing, her body was found under a residential mailbox in a local neighborhood by two men returning from a fishing trip. Investigators are still working to see if Chandler had involvement in any other cold cases. On August 30th, 1991, Don Elaine Sanchez left the Four Seasons Motor Lodge in Los Altos, California with her boyfriend Bernardo Bass. This would be the last time anyone saw Don alive. She was reported missing by her family in October of 1991. A witness came forward. He told investigators that he drove with Don and Bernardo to a junkyard in Sunnydale, California. There, Don and Bernardo got into an argument that ended with Bernardo fatally shooting Don and fleeing the scene. The man refused to testify against Bernardo, so investigators had to try and find more evidence. Bernardo's sister claimed that she sold the car the couple drove. The weapon that was used to take Don's life could not be found anywhere. Investigators searched Bernardo's home with cadaver dogs. The dogs smelled human remains inside a closet. This was unfortunately not enough evidence for an arrest to be made, but then NASA stepped in. In 2009, police officials made their way back to the junkyard looking for anything useful. Digging up the entire field was cost prohibitive, so they needed to find another way to see what might be underground. Metal detectors wouldn't help because the lot was already filled with so much debris. The Menlo Park District Attorney's Office then called NASA engineers. The engineers then deployed a Sensetta Max 5 rover to perform magnetic surveys. The rover is an autonomous ground vehicle. It is designed for Earth science missions to map ground magnetic data and survey points of geological interest underground. The rover did a detailed sweep of what lay beneath the old junkyard, looking specifically for old car parts and possibly the remains of Don Sanchez. It didn't find the victim's body, but it was able to analyze data provided by the rover to give the district attorney's office some very promising points of interest that might be the evidence it sought. Once the points detailed by the rover were excavated, it did indeed reveal old buried car parts that belonged to a 1979 Pontiac Grand Prix that once belonged to Bernardo Bass. Once tested, they revealed that Bass took the victim's body into his car and possibly held her in a closet at his home near the junkyard for some time. Bass was arrested in connection to the case in 2010 and initially pled not guilty. When he realized all the evidence against him and if he was found guilty he was facing 25 years to life in prison. He changed his plea to no contest. This resulted in a six-year sentence for manslaughter. It's not really an ending that brought justice for Don Sanchez.